Good hunter. Good to see you. I want to welcome you uh, to our events on Federal Judo. Our presenters today are Eric and Lisa. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to them. Hiya. Thank you. That's karate, that's not you. <laughs> David Hunter, so glad to see you. Um, my name is Elisa Cooney Liggett, and I am the Director of Student Conduct and the Chair of our Behavioral Intervention Team. And I'm going to open it up and then turn it over to our expert on verbal judo because, believe it or not, you kind of have to have a certificate to teach this. So, luckily, we have a colleague who has that and who will be explaining that. But what I want to make sure you know is how to connect that to some of our community resources. So. The code of conduct doesn't just cover alcohol, drugs, fights, theft. It covers classroom disruption. So if for some reason you had a student in your course who was continuously disruptive, it's not just a matter of going, gosh, what do I do with this student? There are resources to back it up. Now the first thing that we're going to want to talk to you about, even if you have a disruption, is what you're doing on the front end. How do you decide what the expectations are for your classroom behavior? What are your expectations? Like, what's disruptive in your course? Cell phones. Cell phones, yes. Texting. Texting. I mean, te I don't have to say it through my teeth. Texting. What else? Talking. Talking. Pockets of chatter, I call it. What else? These two are the ones I think that happen the most frequently. What can you do on the front end to prevent that from happening in this portion where we still are as the school year begins? Anybody have it in their syllabus? Their classroom expectations for behavior? I do, but I have a head start on this. So <laughs> <laughs> that's it. It is not uncommon to say if you don't want food in your classroom, if you don't want students to read a newspaper in your course, if when presenters arrive, you cannot pack up until the presenter is finished talking. These are basic structural things that are okay to go ahead and say in the beginning, in the syllabus, this is my expectation. Then on the first day of class, this is my expectation. If it's not met, this is what happens. That doesn't mean you're some big ogre. That just says, here's our community expectation. When I ask my students what they think the community expectation is, they say wonderful things like that we all participate, that we're on time, that people aren't distracted during course time. They blow my mind, these are freshmen and you want a one who say this. So believe it or not, students expect that structure. And when you have that one student who is the burr in your side, he's the burr in the side of everyone else and he and everyone wants you to take care of that. So let's say you've done all the preemptive stuff. You know you have a huge class and you're getting the pockets of chatter. What are some of the things you can do? My favorite one, let's just say the two of you are constantly talking giving your lecture, asking some questions, and you casually go by, try to talk to him right now when I'm standing right, awkward, <laughs> it's impossible, <laughs> moving around the classroom and standing by the people, and they're like, is she doing that because she thinks I was talking? He, he knows. I'm trying to be subtle, but the message is pretty clear. So there are some simple things. If it continues, I always believe in addressing it directly, but you can also create a seating chart simplest thing in the universe also is easier to take attendance as you know but if these two are separated half the time that eliminates it and students aren't always trying to be rude in a lot of cases they just genuinely think what they have to say is super important to their friends it's not always them being disrespectful even though when you're standing here it is blatantly disrespectful so saying what's your name Steven Steven um, can I talk to the two of you right after class a, he's probably not going to say anything else for the whole class, which is wonderful. But when he comes up after class, what do you say? He's probably clueless. Stephen, when you talk, when I'm talking, it's distracting to me, and it makes me feel like what I'm saying isn't important, so I just assume if you're not here to participate that you not come. I'd rather count it as an absence. He's probably going to say, oh my gosh, I am so, so sorry. Now, if he doesn't, Part two of what you say, once you've outlined what the problem is and where it crossed the line, number three is, and Stephen, if it happens again, we're going to talk and go over to the um, conduct office. <laughs> I forgot that in my own office. The, what is it? <laughs> oh, the student conduct office. Because at that point, it's disrupting my course and you've had a warning. So outlining the behavior, where it crosses the line, and what happens next time. And you know what? If I get back to my office, Stephen, thanks for adding some clarification. Glad we could have the conversation. Again, I want to reiterate, I don't want to get to this point, so we'll have to go to the conduct office next time. Usually, 
this will handle it. Know this right now though, things like classroom disruption problems do not spontaneously solve themselves without your intervention. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is when it gets more complicated, which is a skill set that Eric is wonderful at. And then if it really becomes a problem in a student that you're concerned about and there may be a crisis, what to do through the behavioral intervention team, also through the conduct office. But before I go, I do have to make sure you know how to say one important thing and we always do this in classroom management because it's really beyond what they ever teach you in grad school. If you have someone who is just constantly combative in your course, Eric's going to talk about what to do in that case to make sure that we can de-escalate instead of escalate. But you have got to be the one that role models. I know that they're wrong and you're right. I know. But you are the bigger person in this. If it escalates though, Something you've probably never practiced saying is, I'm going to ask you to leave, and if you don't leave, I'm going to call the police. So we're going to practice so that you get all the willies out. So I'm asking you to leave my classroom. If you don't, I'll have to call the police. You guys said it in nice voices. It does not have to be some threatening, you know what, you want a piece of this? <laughs> this does no good. No, you never want to be derisive. Steve, no wonder you're getting an F. No, you want to role model what the behaviors are. And so Eric is going to discuss a little bit more about what that looks like and how to kind of keep the upper hand so that the student is, you know, it's not getting to a place you don't want it to and you're getting buy-in. So thank you for that expertise. So it's so easy to follow Lisa, as you can tell, because she really warms things up just correctly. So when you say, if you don't leave, I have to call the police. I'm the guy that shows up, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And um, we're going to talk a little bit about maybe some ways to intervene before it even gets to that point. So I'm going to ask you to kind of open your minds up a little bit. I know that you have uh, a very set way of doing things. We all do in probably great ways that work. Uh, but I'm going to introduce you today, and I want to emphasize introduce. I'm going to give you a bit of a, an aroma of what verbal judo is. I can't give you the main course because the main course would take about two days. So I might be able to, to squeak it into about five or six hours. And you know what? If we get rave reviews and you want me to come back and do that one time, I will do that. I would love to do it because I really believe in this stuff. And the reason I believe in this stuff is because over my many years of law enforcement, I've figured out that this is all about common sense. So I'm not going to talk too much about it until we get into it, but I want, to, I want to tell you a little bit about verbal judo. Dr. George Thompson. Dr. George Thompson, I had the pleasure of, of listening to him speak twice and actually going through a week-long instructor's course with him. Um, he passed away last year, unfortunately, uh, and he had a very eclectic background, very unique background. Not only did he teach uh, English at the high school level, but he also taught at university. He taught English literature. And he also, on top of that, was a full-time police officer for many, many years. And then he was an auxiliary police officer. So he had a very unique bag of tricks, so to speak. Uh, he also had black belts in both judo and taekwondo. So all of these things that are going on at university, teaching students, on the streets, teaching bad guys, and, and before I go on, my foot, I, I did not break it practicing verbal judo, okay? <laughs> if I did, you my credibility would have gone out the window, okay? Uh, but he, he had that street kind of practice, and he was able to incorporate into many different things. He developed the only nationally recognized tactical communication class, and that's the other name for verbal judo. Sometimes on the street, when you tell police officers, I'd like to teach you verbal judo, they kind of start singing kumbaya and think, all right, what is that, a touchy-feely kind of thing, and it's anything but that. But he also termed the, 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 the you know, phrase tactical communication, so Dr. George Thompson. All right, goals of the course, enhance professionalism. Now, you're saying I'm already professional. Yes, you are, but what I want to emphasize is professionalism versus, versus taking things personally. Because when I get up in the morning and I put on a uniform or my, my, uh, my tie or whatever and I look in the mirror, at, at that point, that's when I kind of put on my, my face, right? I'm still a personable guy, 
But when I go to work, I've got my professional face on rather than my personal face. And we're going to get more into that in just a minute. Develop a habit of mind towards conflict. This is cool stuff, right? You're going to go, where was this 30 years ago? Oh, it was there and you've been using it. But a habit of mind, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, because we are creatures of habit. The things that we do, the things that we say, the places we go, the way we react, those are all habits of mind. So we're going to talk about that specifically when it comes to dealing with conflict. And let me stop right here. This is not just for your classroom. I hope, I hope that you never have to use this in your classroom, but you probably will at some point. But it's also for home, it's with your friends, it's for everything in life. Learn new ways of handling verbal conflict. If you're like me, I know you're, you're going to say, Eric, you're a conflict avoider? Absolutely. Now, how are you a police officer and a conflict avoider? I've had to learn over the years to understand what conflict is and then work on myself to be able to deal with that conflict so I can do it effectively. Know when and how to act when words fail. Here's the deal. We had a police officer go through our course and he came back. He called me or emailed me. He contacted me and said, Eric, he said, I got to tell you, I got into a bad situation last week because I was doing everything you guys taught and the bad guy, uh, he, 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 he assaulted me. And I'm like, well, there's a point by which your words fail and you have to take action. And we'll talk about what that action is and how that's appropriate to your classroom. Let, okay, now who in this room does not want to lessen personal stress on the job at home? Who? Raise your hand if you want. Does anyone not have stress? Okay, all right, thank you very much. Uh, learning how to balance that because you have this, what we call, habit of mind in understanding and practice in dealing with, with conflict. See, and this, this is good stuff. Verbal judo, the mastery of communication by redirecting behavior with words. True story, second grade, Eric Grabsky, kind of a little kid. Eric Grabsky would walk home from second grade every day in the first two weeks of class, and I got beat up by Mike Forsey. Everybody remembers names from the past. You know Mike Forsey? <laughs> <laughs> we got to talk after class. Sir, if you don't leave, I'll have to call the police. <clears throat> Mike Forsey. Mike Forsey used to meet me at a certain spot when I'd walk home, and he used to punch me in the face, he used to punch me in the side, he used to trip me, he used to harass me, he used to bully me. So, you know, this was not very good, and I'd go home, uh, and I, I didn't tell my parents at first, because I was a little embarrassed by it. Well, eventually, they, I guess they saw what was going on, and they said, so what are you doing about it? I said, I'm just letting him beat me up, I guess. So they sent me to judo classes, honest. And what is, what is the first thing that my judo instructor said? Now, Eric, do not use this stuff until you know it. So two weeks later, three weeks later, four weeks later, I can't remember how long, Michael Forsey met, Michael Forsey met me at the same spot, and I so very gently threw him over a fence. <laughs> Literally. It was a very high fence. I was only second grade. But I threw him over a fence. Michael Forsey never bothered me again after that time. So I used Michael Forsey's actions kind of against himself, so to speak. Redirecting behavior with words. All right, judo, get down to it. Ju means gentle. Do, do means way. So the gentle way as opposed to karate, which we don't have time to get into. But judo means the gentle way. Redirecting rather than resistance. And we're going to talk about what you do if you don't have that professional face on. When you're just dealing with things the way you would naturally do them, it doesn't go well sometimes. Maximum efficiency, maximum effectiveness with minimum effort. That's good stuff. And it is a contact art. Now, to be able to interact with someone, you've got to have contact with them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And mastery through adaptation. The ability for you to not just be the same person in the same way of dealing with individuals, but understanding the ability to be able to listen to someone, empathize with them, restate what they're saying through paraphrase, drawing the, the line in the sand so that they understand what the expectations are and then giving them an option. I mean, it's, it's that simple. You say that's not simple, Eric. Professional, professional use of language. Again, um, 
your professional face is on at all times. And if I go through some of this a little bit quickly and you want to ask a question, please raise your hands, but I've got a lot of slides and a lot of good stuff to show you. Use of words to achieve professional objectives. Proje professional objectives in your class. Um, you're going to be able to, if you have a student or anyone in your life that gives you verbal conflict, be able to use professional language and professional words to, to reach your objectives. And being in contact with the audience. Skillful communication that is on target. And here's the key. When we just leave it to our own devices, and what I mean by that, our natural selves, we're not able to many times be on target because we allow our feelings, our emotions to take over. And then what happens is it becomes much bigger and what the issue really is, is not dealt with. What's dealt with then is a tit for tat or an escalation as Elisa likes to use it. And we like to deal with it before it gets to that point. What are your goals for teaching? And again, we're enhancing our professionalism here, but let me ask you first, what are your goals for teaching? Absolutely. Teaching information, bringing new ways, helping your students to be able to think critically, to, to look at new ways of, of understanding things. What I want to, and this is the police side of me coming out, but I also need you to remember that this needs to be done safely, all right? Number one goal of verbal judo, for your class to be conducted safely. And really, on campus, if you think about it, if we can't conduct this in a safe environment, then we're not going to be able to conduct what we need to do, and your goals aren't going to be met. Also, the ability to generate voluntary compliance through cooperation and collaboration. Think about voluntary compliance for a minute. Can you make your students do anything? Can you make them? It's a good question. I would argue that you can't make anybody do anything. They have to make the decision. They may not realize that. They may not understand that. But what our goal is, is to have them voluntarily do something. Now, can we remove them from the class? Is that making them do something? Yes. Can we call the police? Yes. Can we fail them from the course? Yes. Those are all things we can do. But our goal is to generate voluntary compliance where they want to do this. And this is all part of the goals of our course. Here's a good one. Elisa and I spoke about this the other day. All of you want to be in control of your classroom. All of you must be in control of your classroom. To be in control of your classroom, you've got to first be in control of you. And what do I mean by that? You all look like very well controlled people sitting here. I don't see any you know, uncontrolled situations going on. But let me just say this, right? When a situation arises, especially a stressful situation, oftentimes we lose control. And we lose control because we haven't thought about that situation, we haven't practiced that situation, we don't know what to say in that situation, we don't know what to do in that situation. So what takes over is our natural tendencies, our natural words, our natural actions. So being in control of yourself. This is great stuff, the habit of mind. Mushin, Have, has anyone heard of this word? It's a Japanese term called mushin. Mushin means literally without mind. Now, you all are not mindless people. I understand this. You all have great thinking minds. Um, I love the university. I've been here for 27 years, 26 years, and the reason I love it so much is because I have a challenge when I come to work every day to be with thinking people and to think myself. We all have minds. But what this means is you are literally taking yourself in your own biases, in your own prejudice, and your own feelings out of the situation. Mushin is a state of mind, and many martial artists use this state of mind uh, when they're in battle uh, and when they're in everyday life. So that when they approach the battle, all the things that are going on in life, you know, I gotta pay this bill, um, I gotta make sure I meet this deadline, uh, my children are talking about leaving home, whatever it is, all those things you can put out of your mind so you can deal with the situation. To remain open, flexible, and unbiased. This is a very difficult thing to do because we all have our own points of view. And again, this doesn't mean that you're agreeing with the other person. This means that you're able to be flexible and open and understand and hear what they're saying. Disinterested. Now, 
disinterested when you first see it, it, it you're thinking, oh, I'm just not paying you any attention. And that's not what we mean. And I have a little video clip to kind of illustrate what we're talking about here. Pardon me. While I get to it. There we go. I thought this would be appropriate also with uh, football season here. We're not endorsing Budweiser here, but we are endorsing the disinterested uh, uh, state of mind. Now, I guess we could argue, is he, uh, is he disinterested or is he just completely tuned her out? I think he's completely tuned her out, but that obviously helped him in his job. Uh, but Mushin is remaining disinterested and actually being able to tune out your own, your own immediate thoughts and, and words and also understand what the person's saying without becoming emotionally attached to it. All right, ways to, her to handle verbal conflict in your classroom, in your life. Na we talked about this, natural reaction vers versus a studied response. When I, I don't know if you're like me, I think you probably are in some ways. When I get up in the morning, I'm not necessarily a nice person. I know you might find that hard to believe, but I wake up and it takes me a little while to get going because the first thing I'm thinking when I get up is why do I have to get up? Why, you know, I might be thinking of a million different things, but it takes me a little while. If I'm not prepared for a stressful situation, which conflict is, the same thing happens. I, if I'm not prepared for that, my natural response, my natural words are going to be disastrous. Now, I've been married for 27 years and I can tell you that this is true. I'll tell you an example. When I asked my wife if she would do something once, and I've also, uh, she's got, I've gotten a written disclosure, I can talk about her. When I asked her to do something once, she didn't do it. So I told her, well, I guess I'll have to do it myself. And she looked at me and she said, I guess you will. So, my natural words are disastrous. And I've learned that in my marriage. I've certainly learned that with my children. I've got a 24-year-old and a 22-year-old. And I've learned a lot about verbal judo just by living life with those two guys. And I, I, I'm convinced that aliens take them over about 14, 15 years old. They bring them back when they're about 24. But somewhere in that time period, they're not there. But I've certainly learned that my words are definitely disastrous when they first come out of my mouth. So what are we talking here about a studied response? And again, that means being, like we talked about earlier, being in control of yourself. You have a student that's disruptive verbally, and maybe when you go and you stand over next to them, they're not getting the hint, right? Or they're coming up to you uh, in the middle of class or before class starts, and they want to argue with you about a grade that you give them, about not being able to make up a test, whatever. You've got to study what's happening in this situation and not just react to it. Here are some universal truths. And if, if, if these are not correct, please raise your hand and we can argue them. Wouldn't you agree that all people want to be treated with dignity and respect? I would say so. Want to be asked rather than being told to do something? Now, if you come from different generations, I think that you might, in, when, I, when I was in the Army, I didn't necessarily, I may have wanted to be, asked, but I know that I was told quite often what to do. And I got used to that, but that was my choice. Um, want to be told why they're being asked to do something. Again, generational. Any of your students ask why a lot? Um, and that's not such a bad thing. I think we want our students to, to understand why in the appropriate setting and in an appropriate way. Want to be given options rather than threats. All right? I understand. Here are some options. Now that doesn't mean you're making concessions. That doesn't mean that you're bending the rules. That doesn't mean that you're putting the integrity of your classroom or your college or your program in jeopardy. 
what it means is that you're painting the options for them and the consequences. If you don't leave the classroom right now, I will call the police. You've just presented some options for them. And that's up to them to decide whether they want to leave or not. But you've at least presented the options to them. And want a second chance. I think we all want a second chance. Thank goodness for second chances. Sometimes we don't get them, but I'm so grateful for second chances in life because sometimes you just need them. Ways to handle conflict. Again, deflect by using phrases such as Okay, well apparently that phrase did not want to come down. Let's see, let's try it again. No, nope, it sure didn't. Alright, that phrase, I can tell you what that phrase is. I understand you're angry. And I might be angry in the same situation. However, now, what did I just do? I acknowledged, first of all, does the, per, does the student or whomever you're speaking to, in my case, the suspect, do they understand that they're angry right now? No. Have you ever tried to tell a person that's angry that they're angry? Did you ever, tell, did, did, did you ever try to explain that to somebody? Do they say, oh, you're right, I'm really angry right now, and I'm sorry, and you know, let me stop being angry so we can continue this conversation. No, that's not what happens. What they do is they say, I'm not angry. What do you mean I'm angry? I'm not angry. And it es escalates the situation. So what we do in being disinterested, being unbiased, and not letting our natural reaction come out in our natural words, is we recognize that there's something deeper going on when, than what the words are that are coming out of that person's mouth. Right? Because very rarely will someone say what they really, really mean. Even in a normal situation. And I can tell you again, I have the signed document, I can say this, my wife tells me all the time, what do you mean by, or did you really mean, or we have to talk about it. Because sometimes if I just say it, I'm not even sure what I mean until I get it out more clearly. So, you seem to be angry, and I might be angry, and you're not saying you would be angry, and you're certainly not siding with them. I might be angry in the same situation, however, now there's two schools of thought on the however, because the however is just like a but. The, stu the two schools of thought are, you know what, you really need to clean your, uh, I really want you to be able to go out tonight, but, I'm talking to my kids. And the school of thought is that, well, after the but, you don't hear anything. But what I would argue is that if you tell them that you're listening to them, and show them that you're listening to them, and trying to understand them, they are much more apt to hear what you're about to say. So what you're about to say is a redirection immediately. Immediate redirection by using the goal of what you're trying to get out of what's about to happen. So if it's that they've not turned in an assignment, uh, they want an extension, um, and they're mad and angry, you're bringing them back to whatever that professional goal is. And you're not letting those feelings and those emotions just kind of hang out there and, and guide what is taking place. And the way to do that is just like we said, use deflection and redirection in combination. I hear that you're angry, and under the same circumstances, I might be angry too, however, and then you fill in the blanks. This also allows you to save face for the students. Now there are some times, and we'll talk about this, where you're gonna have to be very direct and you're gonna have to act. And saving face, is, it's way, that, that option is way gone. But I would suggest that most times, if you're able to save face with the student, things will go better. Because we all want to be respected as well, whether we're angry or whether we're not. Whether we feel we've been given an injustice or not. We all want to have safe face. It also shows respect and empathy. But let me tell you a little thing about empathy. Sometimes we confuse empathy and sympathy. sympathy empathy does not mean you condone what's going on. Empathy literally means you're seeing through the eyes of another you see through the eyes of that person. You're not agreeing with them, but you're seeing through their eyes. And that takes listening. It takes understanding. <laughs> I can't help but think about my, I'm sorry, my wife in these situations. She's taught me over the years that she wants to be listened to. I want to fix things. She wants to be listened to. There's a conflict there. So what I've found after years of trial and error 
in getting second chances is that if I listen to her and truly understand things through her point of view, even though I don't agree with her, things always go better. Always go better. This is really cool too. It, dis it disempowers the other. All right? So when you're showing empathy, when you're listening to someone, it disempowers someone for you to use this, this technique. Because all of a sudden, well, wait a minute. Okay, yeah, I, okay. and you're giving me options and the control is being taken back by you and not by the student. And you know, it just sounds good. It really does. When you hear someone do this, I hear Elisa do it all the time. When she does it, I'm like, man, that sounds good. I need to work on that. Remain the, remain the contact professional. Not using your natural self, your natural face, your natural words. How long do we have? I should have asked that. Are we till two? 15 more minutes. Okay, great. You're in contact with yourself. You're in contact with the institution and the goals of the institution, the goals of your department, the goals of your class. And you're also in contact with the, the other person or the student in this case. So do you see you are the, you're the hub, you're the center, you're the, the middle part of that wheel and things revolve around you and that's why it's so important for you to be in control and understand that you're the fulcrum in all of this. Knowing your weaknesses. The path to strength is built on recognizing weaknesses. Now, if you don't know what your weaknesses are, true story, we had a job interview a couple of days ago, and a gentleman came in, and when asked, so tell us about some of your weaknesses and how you overcome them. Pretty typical job interview question. Sat there, and I went like this. Really don't think I have any weaknesses. Why don't you start with vanity and pride? Just check that out, see how that works for you. And then uh, get back with us. <laughs> so, if you want to know where your weaknesses are, you can ask a couple different people. Ask a brother, a good friend, a sister. Ask if you have children. Ask your children. This is bold, all right? This is very bold. If you have children, ask your children. They will tell you what your weaknesses are. Now, you need to have a good habit of mind when you do this, right? Because you might use some natural words that you wouldn't want to use. Name them, define them, own them. We all have weaknesses. It's okay. That's who we are. We can all overcome those weaknesses by understanding them and taking control of them and not defending them. Understanding communication. Dr. George Thompson says, people never say what they mean, especially under stress. I wouldn't say they never say what they mean. I think that's a pretty extreme statement. I would say that most times, almost always, people don't say what they mean. They use words and the meaning is deeper. I'm just going to kind of keep going through this because I think some of it is a little redundant. All right, so you respond to the meaning rather than to what the words are. Again, we have our angry students. You've given them a grade that they don't feel that they deserve. They're angry. What you're understanding is that although they're being verbally loud and possibly even disrespectful, that there's meaning behind that. And you're not reacting to those words. What you're doing is you're redirecting to what the real problem is. Here we go. I can't believe you won't let me take the exam. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. You're the worst professor on the face of the planet. I just want to die. Is that far-fetched? I don't think so. I think we've heard things like that. And students make comments like that. The I want to die part, Elise is going to cover in a little bit. Um, but now is that... Is that tr literally what this person means? I don't think so. <laughs> That's when you say, I need you to leave or I'm going to call the police. Right. So, the meaning. What do they mean? Maybe they need help. Maybe they're fearful. I know when I'm overwhelmed, I speak languages that don't even exist. So, there's meaning behind those words and it's important for you to understand that. And it's important for you to respond to the meaning and not to the words. Important concept here. Content of what you say, communication. The words, the actual words that come at yourself. Only 7 ten, or to 10% of your communication. What you say is only 7 ten, to 10%. Ten your voice, whether I'm talking like this or whether I'm talking like this. The way your voice, the intonation, the reflection, those make up 33 to 40% of communication. 
other nonverbals. We all know this. Whether I'm like this, whether I'm like this. I didn't realize this. This is a power stance. My wife taught me this. She does it all the time, by the way. But this is a power stance. I didn't realize that. Our nonverbals, what will happen is, what happens between this up to 73, really 73% or 93% will overrule the words. So if somebody's talking to you and they're saying something and you see something different, what's happening is you're not, under, you're not taking the words at face value, you're taking what they're doing and their actions at face value. So your delivery style is 93% of communication. Paraphrase, one of the most powerful tools in the human language. Paraphrase, put the other person's perspective into your words and then feed it back to them. Now what does this do? This is a very empowering thing. If, I, if you're arguing with me and I say, just a minute, I really, I really want to understand what you're telling me. Is what you're telling me blah? Now will you just keep going on and on? I don't think so because don't you want me to understand what you're telling you? Right. Now you might be angry and you might still be ranting and raving, but what do we do? We just kind of stop things for a minute and the tone of things have changed and all of a sudden, okay, well, Oh, this person wants to hear what I have to say. Very, very powerful. You can interrupt people when they're angry with you, when they're upset with you. We call it the sort of interruption. Let me be sure I understand what you just said. I pro 99 times out of 100, that person's going to stop and say, oh, okay, well, let me tell you. You're feeling blank because of blank. Is that true? It, it's so powerful. In uh, Thompson's book, which you can go online and get, I highly recommend it. There's several things that this does. Um, and I, I didn't list it on the PowerPoint, but the sort of interruption. Sorry, I should have this marked better. Here we go. Magically, in one sentence, by paraphrasing, you've hooked the other person. They're listening. Using this sort of interruption without the sense is only one way I know to interrupt somebody without generating further resistance. Two, you have taken control because you're talking and he is listening. Three, you're making sure of what you had heard is right. Four, if you had not heard the person accurately, they'll correct you. Five, you've made the other person feel better and be a better listener. And it goes on and on. So there's some very, very powerful things that happen when you use this sort of interruption and when you paraphrase. And remember to remain disinterested. Remember that you can't allow those personal things to come into play. All right, we're almost done. Let's talk about tactics real quick. Now, there's a little bit of language. Anybody opposed? It's not severe, but a little bit. You all right with that? Okay, I always ask that. There we go. Anybody else for dealing? No, it's great. My way or the highway. If anybody wants to walk through the town. Walk him, but be nice. You can't walk him, 
Be nice until it's time to not be nice. <laughs> I absolutely love it. And I got to tell you, I live it. I really certainly live that. Uh, <clears throat> there is a time to be nice. And you know what? I'm not suggesting you put any of this in your syllabus, okay? <laughs> However, there's some, there some truth and common sense uh, to what the video tells us. And that's, don't take it personally. I learned a long time ago from one of my mentors. The minute I start taking my job personally, I've got to rethink what I'm doing. And I've done it many, many times. I've got my feelings hurt. I've gotten upset. I've gotten angry. I thought I was done injustice. But I've had to get myself back in control. If you get personal with your students, it's not going to go well. I'm going to go through these quick, some tactics. Ask the student. Just like Patrick Swayze said, ask. Set the context. Now, if you don't do this assignment, or if you don't do this, then this is what's going to happen. Explain your options. Confirm non-compliance. Now, I'm hearing you, you're not going to leave the classroom right now. And then act. Now, what do we mean by acting? Do I have time to show this clip? Yep, we're good, okay. Because this is a classic. Sorry, there we go. It's not showing up. So, no, I'm not advocating you bring gun class. What I'm advocating is when it's time <laughs> to act, you act. Sometimes it's the most difficult thing to do. And especially if you've not planned like he planned ahead, then you may not know exactly what to do. So when it's time to act, act. And by acting, what we mean is... You let the student know that they've got to leave the class or you're going to call the police. Or you, dis or you have the student leave the class. Or you dismiss the class for a break for the day. If it's gotten out of control, you dismiss the class. You can do both of those things. Call us if you feel threatened. Now, there, when words go to the point where you feel threatened, that's the time to call the police. Dismiss the class if you feel threatened and you call the police. And refer the student to BIT, and at least he's going to call that, talk about that in just a minute, when the student displays behavioral issues. Less stress, yes. When you practice these techniques, you can reduce the amount of stress in your life by understanding yourself, others, and knowing when and how to act.
Any questions? All right. Thank you, Eric. As Eric said, even in my job, dealing with behavioral issues or with um, students of concern, if I think something is imminent or I feel there's a safety concern, I call the police. I don't want you to call me. I don't have a gun. I'm five foot five. <laughs> we need to stabilize the situation first and then act. But I want to make sure that all of you have a copy of our bit folder. Is there anyone who this does not look familiar to? Raise your hand. You can have one. Thanks to CTE. I forgot I mine. You can have two. You can keep them wherever you want. Does everyone else have one for sure? Okay. Um, the behavioral intervention team is here to deal with any students of concern who may be a threat to themselves or a threat to others. So it's nice to be on a campus where we can decide is it a behavioral issue? Is it something that may need mental health above some sort of just general consequence? What we do is set students who are in distress up with the necessary resources. We also follow and track to make sure that the same issues aren't reoccurring. So it's nice that even prior to the Virginia Tech tragedies, we already had this in place. And so we work closely with the counseling center and with the police. So where would you see this? Either a student who responds grossly disproportionately to something that you have said. Might be a conduct issue, might be a bit. Doesn't matter. If you send it to us, we'll figure it out. We have most of our faculty referrals come from faculty members who receive an email asking for an extension that doesn't just say may I have an extension it's four pages long about all of the awful things happening in the student's life and they really are awful awful things and you go crud what in the world do I do with this so there's a good place to send that if you choose to just send it to the counseling center that is fine but most people say I want to be able to fill out an incident report which is right here sc.edu slash bit once you hit go on that, it goes to Eric, it goes to me, it goes to the Counseling Center, it goes to University Housing, so that we can try to find that student, make sure that we put a touch on them and say, hey, some people are concerned about you. Come on in so we can work with you to make sure that you're okay. Now, can be grossly behavioral. Usually, that's what it's designed to do. Most people just say, I need some help with the student, and I don't know what to do. Anybody in here teach physics or teach a hard science? Those folks especially go, I don't do feelings and I've got a live one that has a bunch of them. Can someone help me with this? And we say, yes. So please know the resources around campus are on both sides. If it's behavioral and somebody just needs, this is a consequence to your actions or needs some more long-term help, we're here to help you with that. In the moment, you've got that under lockdown now too. So we just want to be able to be helpful to you in any way we can. Any questions for Eric or for me?